listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is Rob McConnell, and you're listening to us live and around the world on the Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, the IPBN Radio Network, and Talkstar Radio Network. If you'd like to send us an email, it's very simple, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. Yes, that's Exxon Radio TV. And our radio website, where you can find out what we've been up to, what we're doing today, and where we're we going in the future. And I'm not a psychic or a remote viewer, but I can only tell by the past where we are in the present, where we're going to be in the future, at www.exoneradio.com. And don't forget, my good friend uh, Jeremy Scott follows me tonight, as he does Monday through Friday, on Dark 30. Great guy, great show. I always have fun whenever I get the opportunity of chatting with him. And by the way, did you know that... When you're on the road now with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can listen to the Exxon and Jeremy on Dark 30 and every minute of the Mutual Broadcast Network by dialing 605-562-4204, courtesy of Talk Stream Live. No smartphone app or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. All you need to do is call 605-562-4204 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. My guest this hour, a man with an amazing story. His name is Charles Stansberg, but we all call him Chuck because he's our buddy. He's a MUFON State Section 6 director, star team member, CAG member, and field investigator. And uh, Chuck, what is a star team member? Well, uh, a star team member uh, for MUFON is someone that goes out to uh, 
when there's mutilations, landings, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, it was October thousand two thousand thirteen. We had a uh, mutilation going on down there, south southwest of here, and it was Barbado sheep. And uh, if you if you yeah. always knew about cattle mutilations, they have a little slit up and towards their throat mm -hmm. where they where they drain all the blood out. Right. These these sheep had the same identical thing. Is this the case in uh, Port La Cava, Texas? Yeah, Port La Baca. Right. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, quite some. We were down there for two days uh, covering this. Um, everybody's trying to say that it was predators, but <clears throat> I don't think predators can have. Hmm. I don't think predators have uh, uh, tools to do surgery. Is it possible that it's our own terrestrial military and government who are going out and doing something to to test the genetics or to test the certain uh, effects that fertilizers and other GMO products are having on livestock on the open range? No. <clears throat> um, this particular time, all the photos, because mm -hmm. when, when I went down there, <coughs> excuse me, I went and talked to the sheriff. Right. Also, I asked him if I could get all the photos pertaining mm -hmm. to the uh, event and also all the paperwork going back and forth when he would report and then they would go out and do their thing and come back and report what's going on. So <clears throat> he got all that for me. Um, and I was going through, uh, they gave me a DVD of the, of the photos. And I was going through the photos. And number 345, I took a look at that, and I thought, something's weird about this. So I, I got, a hold of my, got a hold of my friend on Skype. I said, I'm going to show you something. So I showed, him, I showed him the photo, and he goes, oh, yeah. He says, uh, he says, matter of fact, he says, take a look a little bit closer if you want to. The the day the night before it was one heck of a a uh, thunderstorm. So right. Everything was wet, and muddy, mm -hmm. and everything. You can see the tracks where this gentleman has his little putt putt, and it stops hmm. uh, right right by a tree. <coughs> you have the sheep laying here, mutilated, and then you have the tracks going past that, and then there's a big area that is um, there's no trees. It's just uh, bare spot and I looked at that he says he says what do you see and I thought oh my gosh I says that is in a circle and this is it looks like it's it's uh, counterclockwise he says yep he says matter of fact they're still there I said what do you mean they're still there during in, in, the, in the photo Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life is no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. 
I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Welcome back, everyone. Our guest this hour is Charles Chuck Stansberg. And uh, we're talking to Chuck about, amongst other things, his position as a gunnery officer aboard a battleship that is so big that it's actually moored on the other side of Pluto so that telescopes can er- from Earth cannot see it. It houses up to 500,000 souls of every race, every species. Wow. And um, Chuck, before we get back to your ET visit, because I want to talk to you about some other parts of the visit. Um, Didn't the sheriff in this case, going back to the cattle mutilation, I'm sorry, the sheep mutilation, actually believe it to be a satanic cult ritual? They tried to say that was, uh, but there was no, say, there was none of those uh, outfits nearby anywhere. Um, <clears throat> they tried to say just about everything and anything to, to mm-hmm. make sure that it wasn't a UFO. But but weren't I, I there but weren't there way. other animals weren't <clears throat> there weren't there other animals that were missing as well that the that the amount of animals that were missing or that were mutilated had increased over a period of time. Yeah, he. Uh, this gentleman had 52 sheep to begin with because a friend gave him a bunch of them because he had to, he was he couldn't do anything anymore he was pretty well down where he can't yeah. keep the sheep sheep but anyway he uh, he sold about 20 of them or so and the rest of them he would come out and there would be the next morning, and there would be a couple of them mutilated, and then one or two that are gone, mm-hmm. just flat disappeared. But why was and, it why was it reported in the newspaper that your findings were confidential? That you didn't release your findings to the sheriff's office or to anyone else? Well, because we were 
like I said, doing an ongoing investigation. And once I left the scene, more or less, because mm-hmm. we were there for two days, Yeah. Um, our state director stayed there for another day. And she wrote up her report, which mm-hmm. would be the secondary report, and mine was the major report. And I didn't put it in as a predator because it wasn't a predator. Predator don't know how to cut open a belly and just just take the uh, they they would they would cut around mm-hmm. and then fold fold the uh, belly back the uh, skin back and pull the belly out lay it down mm-hmm. and take the uh, re- reproductive organs and that was it. Yeah, but he, but the sheriff never even suggested that it wasn't anything um, other than uh, terrestrial, you know, because uh, this is a quote uh, from Calhoun County Sheriff Ailman, uh, believes a human is behind, I believe a human is behind the killings. Well, that's that's his prerogative, I guess, that what he thinks it was, um, but... When I when I saw what I saw mm-hmm. on the on the on the film, yeah, I knew who done it. Okay, now yeah. here you here you are, a guy who's been on board battle starships. You're a gunnery officer. You have seven people in your team. You go on galactic uh, tour of duties f- around four times a month. Isn't there any way that you can use your your pull, so to speak, to to end all these mysteries? To say that, well, if these if these if Sarek and his and his battle star are protecting the galaxy and protecting us from the bad guys, the bad aliens, how are these bad aliens coming down and doing the cattle mutilation? And if it's not the if it's not the bad aliens, that only leaves Sarek and crew doing this mutilation. And well, if they're, they're doing the and if, and, they, and if they are doing the mutilation, it doesn't seem like they're as good as you're painting them out to be. <laughs> what they do now, the, the vegans are reptilian uh-huh. and they're, they're meat eaters. So if they if they want to take a cow mm-hmm. up, there's nothing left of it. Probably just the bones. Um, if they're if they're meat they don't they don't do they don't mm-hmm. do anything like that. What's doing it is the little helpers, you might say. Um, <clears throat> they're probably four foot. Some of them are five foot, and they do their thing as far as uh, I, I'm, I'm, assume, I'm assuming that what they need the pre- reproductive organs for is to clone more sheep. And that way they have their own stuff somewhere else. Why wouldn't they just take sheep and keep them on board once they've got the necessary uh, samples or or tissues that they need to do the cloning? Eat the rest of the animal. Why put it back to Earth? That makes no sense. Well, it never left Earth. Uh, They were right there on the ground. The ship was... The ship was laying there, evidently, because it was a counterclockwise mm-hmm. uh, space there. Right. And uh, on the right-hand side of the film, mm-hmm. there's there's a like a a distortion uh, per se on by by the trees back there. And what that was is a doorway, uh, either on to board their ship or. Um, maybe going from earth to where their ship is i, I don't know but <clears throat> but why would they need to take everything you know if we want to extract dna we don't have to rip a person apart true there's ways that we can extract dna you know without killing this is something that doesn't make sense if it's just for the dna they're after they could do it in other ways where they wouldn't leave this trace evidence of something being wrong. So, I, I agree with you there because I took a look at a lot of the different areas where the, the sheep were mutilated. Mm-hmm. And I, I scratched in my head like, why? Why did they do what they did when they could just take the whole thing? Um, or just take a tooth. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, or, or just take a, a bone marrow sample. You know, uh, this, you know, and they can do the same thing with the cattle. They can do the same thing with the horses. And this leads me to another question. Are the amount of people that are disappearing from this planet actually being abducted and not taken, brought back, that they are being kept somewhere against their will by some nefarious group of extraterrestrials and are being used for breeding stock? Not that I know of. Um, on Sarek's ship, there are a little over 200 humans. Mm -hmm. um, and they are up there on their own accord because they don't want to come back down to Earth. Right. A lot of them don't have families. Uh, you know, if you have, if you think about it, all the, the missing right. uh, people in, in this world, I can tell you where a lot of them are. <laughs> where? Because I've seen, I've seen a lot of them up there on the, the ship. Where? And they're, they're, they're just as happy. So they're being abducted or they're going willingly? Willingly. So why don't they leave a note? Why all the secrecy? Why all the, you know, people talk about the government having ulterior motives and doing black ops. It doesn't seem that the extraterrestrials are any different than the problems we're facing here on this planet. <laughs> it's, it's about, well, might be pretty close to it, but uh, they don't interfere with whatever takes place here on Earth, like the wars and stuff like that, because they're not allowed to by the Galactic Alliance. They tell them, you do not interfere with any of the worlds around here. Just leave them be. Uh, if they want to kill each other off, then fine. That doesn't seem right. No, it doesn't seem right, but I, I, I agree with you there. Because I've, I've asked them, I said, you know, how come you guys don't uh, go in here and say, okay, to, to one of these certain countries, I ain't going to say any, uh, but these certain countries that's doing all this stuff, why don't you take care of these bad guys we're not allowed mm -hmm. to and that's what I get they're not allowed uh -uh. but they're allowed to kill livestock they're allowed to abduct people they're allowed to protect us from other alien alien uh, beings Entities, yeah. but they won't protect us against ourselves so what are they protecting us against and why are they protecting us if they're not going to do a damn thing about what's going on here well, they tried, uh, like I said, that they had went to all the different uh, countries mm -hmm. and to, to their leaders, and, and even the even the even the president of the United States uh, said, "I don't want to hear it," you know, because this is what this is what's going on. We got to take care of our business, and we got to take care of our people here, you know, and make sure that none of them get killed from people from overseas and this and that. And <clears throat> they just tried to get everybody together and say, look, you mm -hmm. are a one species, um, and this is a human species, the human beings. So why don't you all stay together and be nice, and you know, why, why worry about different uh, uh, countries and stuff and, and, and ground? You want, you, want to, you want to take this place, take that place? Why? You know, I don't understand that myself either. Uh, <coughs> All right, so it's looking at looking at the big picture, Charles, something doesn't something doesn't make sense here. The it's not adding up because if they are here mm -hmm. and if they are supposed to protect us, if they have the ability to share a peaceful solution that would solve the problems of this planet, feed the sick, Heal the, uh, you know, I'm sorry, feed the, hung, feed the hungry, heal the sick, make this a better world. Wouldn't they benefit by this as well? They probably would, but uh, like I said, they can't interfere uh, on earth of what's going on. So um, if I they... I wish they could. I wish they would. I wish they could. Mm -hmm. But uh, I keep talking to them about it, but they say we can't do it. Um, and yet, and yet, they will stop another species from coming to our planet. What happens if the other species would treat us better? Or that the other species would be much more conducive to communicating with planet Earth and its leaders? They could be stopping well, progress. There's, there's a few of them that 
want to try to do that. Um, as far as uh, I don't know what you mean by all right, Chuck. Entities, we're go- we're going to be we're, might say. we're going to be back on the other side of this news break. Exo Nation, send me an email. Tell me what you think. Exxon at exxonradiotv.com. Chuck and I will return on the other side of this news break as we continue here and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, and the IPBN. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X zone broadcast network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried, He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Dagaronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Welcome back, everyone. This is um, an interesting story. Charles Stanberg is our special guest, and he is a MUFON State Section uh, 6 director. He is a STAR team member, CAG member, and field investigator. He is also a gunnery officer aboard an extraterrestrial battleship that houses about uh, 5,000 people, souls from all over the galaxy and the beyond. Um, 
Charles, tell us about your family, your other family on the other side of the galaxy. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, I've gone uh, to several different um, planets in our galaxy. Um, and there was uh, probably two of them, I think, were being overrun by uh, naughty ETs. And we went in there to make sure that they didn't do anything else. Uh, we got rid of them, uh, and they ran, and, and and we, of course, we destroyed a few of their ships. But other than that, they took off. Like, wow, we don't need to be here. But um, also, they I would go to one planet that's about maybe uh, about 200, 250 light years away that are that's in here in our galaxy. And it's a beautiful planet. And uh, I got to know the people there. And and the first time I saw it, it, <laughs> it kind of startled me in a sense. Cause like, mm -hmm. how did I get here, you know? Uh, because next thing I knew, I was standing on this grass. It was like a grass. And there's a tree sitting over here. And I looked up, and here comes a ship. And it lands, a small ship. And it lands. And two or three people got off, or beings, got off. And I went, I looked over at that craft, and I went, Wow. And they were walking towards this big building. It was, a, it was a solid white building. And I heard one of them saying, hey, are you coming? So I went went down there, and we went around through the building on the other side and went out the back door, and there's a path that goes to waterfalls. <coughs> and it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. But what they did was... They wanted me there a couple of times, mm -hmm. and they went ahead and took my DNA. And I don't know how they impregnate, impregnate their women, but evidently they do it somehow. And I do have, a, I do have a hybrid daughter, and she's a pretty little thing. And uh, it's, it's, it was quite something when I found out about it because when. We went back over there one time. This was like uh, two, three years ago, two years ago. Mm -hmm. When we went over there, they said, uh, we've got a surprise for you. Okay. And we got out of the ship, started walking towards there. And then this tall, this tall gray, she's a, for a, a, a gray alien, she's not bad looking. She, she's about eight tall, about eight foot tall. And this little girl was walking with her. And I said, oh, she's cute. She's, she's really cute. Who's, who's is she? And all three of them said, yours. And I said, excuse me? And they said, she is your daughter. We use your DNA, and she is your daughter. Hmm. So I have a daughter living on another planet. Do you interact with your daughter? Do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, um, once in a while they bring her to the ship, and <coughs> we interact, and, and she plays with, with uh, some of the toys I, I brought on board from Earth, so she knows what Earth looks like, and she knows what Earth, you know, basically what we do there, and uh, so on, so uh, once in a while I'll, I'll go there to the, the planet, and uh, I'll stay there for probably two or three days, mm -hmm. but it's only... It's only a couple hours, right? Really, because when they bring me back, they bring me back in the same time time frame. So, do you have a picture of your daughter? No. Do you keep one in your wallet? You know, like they I, won't allow me to take a picture. Really? Yeah. You know, I, I want to, but you know, you, I tried. <laughs> your 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 story sounds so compelling. What do your other members of Mufon say about your intergalactic travels and the fact that one of their Section directors are on a battle star as a as a gunnery officer. Well, let's put it this way: everybody in my section, which I have uh, about fifty people, including myself, 
everybody knows mm-hmm. that I that I do this mm-hmm. uh, because once in a while we will have a meeting, and I'll say, "What do you guys want to do for the meeting?" And they'll say, "We want to hear more of your stories. We want to hear more of what you do up there." So they they get a, they get kind of excited about mm-hmm. want to know what's going on and, and what you know what I see you know this kind of stuff, and uh, it, it's it's. Move on. They know, especially especially uh, our DOI. He's the director of, of investigations for Move on <clears throat> all over the world. He knows that I do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, I even uh, had him at one of our our meetings with Sarek. Right. And uh, I says, uh, I told I told Steve, I said, go ahead and uh, ask him. He's asking what? I said, well, you said you wanted to go up there. Ask him if you can go. And uh, so he did. And uh, I got a, a private uh, text from um, <clears throat> from Sarek. And it said, do you trust him? And I said, yes, I do very much. He's, he's, a, he's a darn good guy. And uh, so he said, okay, we'll see what we can do. And uh, about two or three weeks later, I asked Steve if he ever went up, and he says, "I don't know." He says, "I haven't, I didn't feel anything or see anything or whatever." And I mm-hmm. said, "Well, I can guarantee you, you were there." He says, "How do you know?" I says, "Because I was standing beside you." <laughs> okay, and, here, here's uh, a question. Here's a question for you. You, as a director of MUFON, are responsible for your investigator team that, that we just believe I, you said it was about 50 people. Yeah. You have, there's only, there's only about three of us that are field investigators. Okay. All right. So, but you have been up in a starship. You are on active duty as a gunnery officer on a starship. So why do these investigations need to take place? If number one, these are real UFO landings, abductions, and sightings that are being reported to MUFON. And number two, how are they getting past these people who are supposed to be protecting us? <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, that part's a good question. Uh, yeah, like it makes no sense, Charles. Like you're a former cop. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Does the Does the... <sighs> Does the investigation line make sense? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes, uh, because we have to ask certain questions when somebody reports a, a UFO. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not asking you to. To I, I understand when you're talking to somebody about a sighting, oh, okay. but you yourself having. Had these experiences, having these experiences, having a daughter that is a hybrid somewhere on the other side of the galaxy, uh, you being a gunnery officer and who said you fired a, a pulse weapon that wiped out a, a spaceship, um, why, do you, we, why is there a need for UFO investigations if you have all the answers? That is a good question. The answers I have are from what I do and what I see. Um, I don't see what other people see, and I don't know if anybody else is being abducted. Uh, I know I've done a few mm-hmm. cases, but uh, as far as their their situation... They say, okay, yeah, this is what I saw, and this is what I saw, right. and this is what I was told by them, and so on and so forth. Um, but when it comes to investigations, that's what I have to do is I have to ask questions. Yeah, I, I, underst- I understand that, but who, whose craft are you investigating? Because you told us that Sarek and the Alliance are protecting us right. from, uh, from, the, from the bad guys. Then if well, the, that I don't know. Um, haven't you asked? There are orange orbs, there are red ones. No, no, no. But, them, but haven't uh, you asked? Haven't you asked Sarek who these UFO sightings are that people are reporting? Who are doing the landings? Because if they're not 
the good guys, how are the bad guys getting past this Galactic Alliance patrol? Well, those guys, those orbs, per se, a lot of them are, I guess it belongs to the, the, the Galactic Alliance because we they have drones as mm-hmm. well. And uh, they they go around. Uh, sometimes they will they will hover, sit for a little bit, and take off. Right. Especially if especially if people see it and they'll mm-hmm. start taking pictures, it'll ta- it'll take off. Um, but a lot of those I think are drones from their crafts to monitor Earth as far as what's going on. Okay, but wouldn't Sarek be able to tell you that if you communicated with him and you said, "All right, I've received a UFO report." On such and such a date, such and such a time, such and such a coordinates, is this one of yours? And if he says yes, fine. But if he says no, then we have to ask ourselves: Is the Galactic Alliance really doing what they're so what they're saying they're doing, or is there a nefarious purpose at play? That's a good question. I don't know. Have problem. you ever asked? I've never asked. Why not? I've never, a- I've never asked if, because I'm I'm on board ship and I don't think about that. Now that you got me going on it, I will probably next time I go up there, I'll ask him. Yeah, and, and when you're on board ship, do you wear a uniform? Um, not really. No? Uh, most of the time, it's just what I got on. Um, sometimes they will, they will hand me a, a uniform, yeah. and I say, no, nah, I don't want to wear it. You know. Do you shower? Do you do you sleep in um in in a hammock in a bed? Do you sleep? Uh, yeah. If if I'm there for you know two or three days, yeah. Um, uh, we have uh we have quarters that we have we sleep in bed. Yeah. And, uh, we shower and we you know they have everything really? for us. Hmm. How about a sick bay? Do they have a sick bay? Yep. So if if we're looking at a comparison between the Starship Enterprise and I, I really can't believe you don't know the name of the starship you're on, but anyway, um, and, and I don't, I can't either. Let's call it the SS Chuck for now, the USS <laughs> Chuck. Okay. All right. If we were to compare the USS Chuck to the USS Enterprise, would be would we be looking at about the same thing? Not quite. No. I- um, it's it's kind of hard to describe. It's bigger than what mm-hmm. the Enterprise is, what have you, you see on TV. Have you ever drawn any pictures? No. Why not? Because I never thought about it. Uh, some of the stuff that I try to to think about what I yeah. saw, I try to start drawing it, and it just doesn't come out right. Because, you know, here you, here you are, a seasoned police officer, mm-hmm. a seasoned investigator, and as a police officer, what are the first things we're taught to do at a crime scene? Sketch. <laughs> Make sure that the crime scene is... Uh, Secure? Not, yeah, not uh, compromised. Right. And? Okay. Crime... And, uh, we take crime, pictures. Right. And so on and so forth. Yeah. You're an investigator with MUFON. I get a lot of photos. Of what's on the Starship? No, of what's on uh, people say. Not oh yeah, st- not the, not not. Yeah, not I'm not talking. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about you. The U.S. Yeah. The U.S. Well, he won't Chuck. allow me. He won't allow me to take pictures. Why not? They they won't allow. If he wants, if he doesn't mind you, if he doesn't mind you coming on uh, radio shows, if he wants you to talk about them, don't you find that a little strange that he doesn't want you to show pictures of? where you are, what you do, because the next question is, how do we know you're telling us the truth? <laughs> and not just making because this I've up. Been there. That's the reason why I know the truth. Here's the thing. When I found out mm-hmm. that I was probably taken, mm-hmm. you know, and I never said another word about it, I've always wanted to go on board ship. I've mm-hmm. always stood outside saying, hey, come on down here. I want to I want to drive one of your craft or get right. into one and go somewhere, do something. And four years, a little over four years ago, I got that chance. And I've been going up there for several times now, you know, since then. And I, I really enjoy it. And there are, I have to 
I get to get some mm -hmm. pieces of what I see. And then what I do is start putting two and two together. I can kind of figure out where I was and what I was doing. All right. <laughs> so hope you don't take my next question wrong, uh, the wrong way. But how do we know that this just isn't a post-hypnotic suggestion that has get, been given to you by the hypnotist who snaps his fingers twice for you to either enter or to exit one of the post-hypnotic uh, suggestions that you were given? Uh, no, he uh, he didn't use any snapping fingers, fingers or anything like that. He just uh, was uh, using a uh, chain, more I see. or less. And uh, he brought me out of it, mm -hmm. and that's when I found out about what took place when I was in when I was coming down the hill uh -huh. uh, from the, from the, from the lake. Is it but, possible that your first abduction actually happened in 1965 in Colorado, and that yeah. you were taken that time by Sarek? It's a good possibility, or somebody else. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Um, I have asked a couple of different beings while I was up there yeah. if they knew back in 1965 when I was young mm -hmm. uh, a senior in high school what was there something that was going on did they take me and most of them uh, two or three of them would just say well we, we can't we can't talk all right about Chuck that. I've got to take my final break please stand by explanation Charles Chuck Stansburg is our special guest, and we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. 
from Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Hey, welcome back, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking all my guests tonight, Robert Favreau. In hour number one, we talked about controlled remote viewing. Hour number two, my good friend, a great Canadian musician, a very talented person, Ed Roman, was talking to us about his new album called, uh, let me see, Craig, what's it called? Oh, right, Red Omen. (sighs) Jeez, it's going to be released tomorrow. Please visit his website, www.edroman.com. And for the last two hours, wrapping me up, wrapping up with me this hour, wrapping me up this hour, yeah, I'm going to feel like a Christmas party, um, is Charles Stansberg. And uh, first of all, Charles, thank you so much for coming on the show. Always great talking to you. Listen. Uh, You're more than welcome, and thank you. I want to believe. I really want to believe, but I'm the kind of guy who needs proof. I'm okay. sure that you come across people who you talk to and, and and you tell this wonderful story to, just like the the fellow members of your MUFON chapter, who are are taken by it, that they and other people want there to be another life force out there so that we're not alone and that we have sort of like a big brother watching over us. You've been on the starship. You've seen the daughter that is part of you through artificial insemination of an extraterrestrial type. You've gone zipping through the cosmos in this battleship. You know, and you believe 150 million percent that it is real. Yes. How can we believe it? How can we believe it? Well, the only way you can really believe it is if you experience it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that there are a lot of people, uh, especially some of the ones I know that are uh, contactees and such, have seen ETs, have seen craft, mm-hmm. have been in them. Um, uh, we have one young lady that with MUFON. She uh, was a field investigator and her crew uh, they went to a field. The gentleman that owned the place he took him out on where the field is, and he said, see, I told you, and he looked up. Here comes a triangle craft over their, over their heads. They just all looked at it, and it disappeared behind the trees. Did, it, Ed, did any of the field investigators take a photo? I don't think so. They, Why? They just, yeah, Why? That's, what, that's, what I, that's what I say. What? Why do we but, get all these fantastic uh, stories and never any proof? <laughs> Well, there are there are a lot of proof of people taking photos and videos. Um, some of the some of the craft that I've seen mm-hmm. uh, was amazing. Uh, some of the photos I've got, uh, I've got pretty close. Well, I've got over six hundred cases done, and uh, some those... of the, some of the ones I've got with videos mm-hmm. are uh, uh, just unbelievable. All right, but how many of those six hundred cases are actually? UFOs from another planet. I would say probably about 75%. Then how come there's no proof anywhere besides the proof that is taken photographically? How come? Good question. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of the governments have seen them. Mm -hmm. Um, They're they're, 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 uh, presidents or whoever they are. Chuck, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, spending two hours with me. It is uh, greatly appreciated. And tell Sarek that I would love to have the opportunity of meeting him one-on-one. Okay. All right, Chuck, take care of yourself, my friend. Regards to you and the family, and family on this side of the universe as well as the other. Okay, thank you Good night, Charles. 
XO Nation, I'll be back tomorrow night at 6 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the XO. So until then, keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone. <laughs>